What is up guys? So in this video, we're going to talk about the different types of divisions that have women's college volleyball. So if that's what you're interested in learning, stick around and we're going to dive in deep. All right. So there are 334 NCAA division one schools that have volleyball. There are 289 NCAA Division II schools that have women's college volleyball. There are 437 NCAA Division III schools that have women's college volleyball. There are 220 NAIA schools that have women's college volleyball. There are 67 four-year schools that don't fall into an NCAA or an NAIA category. There are 313 NJCAA two-year schools that have women's college volleyball. And there are 133 two-year schools that don't fall under the NJCAA category. But I'll talk about what some of those do fall under later. So that was a lot of numbers and I'm sure you're like, well, okay, wow, there is a lot of women's college volleyball out there. And there is, there is a ton, which is super exciting because this is the point I always try to give young volleyball players. If you want to play college volleyball, we can find a place for you every year. There are always scholarships that go unused. So if you wanna play, we can make it happen. We can find a place for you. So let's dig into what um, NCAA means. So NCAA stands for National Collegiate Athletic Association. Kind of a tongue twister. But that is the governing body that is over the um, types of colleges. So it set the rules, they create an equal playing ground so that they can have a national championship. So all of these schools that fall under the NCAA um, category, which they pay to get in it, they, um, they have to follow all the exact same rules so that there's a level playing field all across each division. So division one, NCAA schools have a median undergraduate um, student body size of 8,960. That was very precise. That's why I had to look at my screen to get the exact number. So that's the um, average amount of undergraduate students that they have enrolled in their school. This creates a ratio of 1 to 23 student athlete to non-student athlete on campus. So that's kind of a cool statistic, kind of a cool way to look at it. So out of every 23 people on campus, at least one of them is going to be a student athlete. Division one schools also have the highest standard for recruiting practices, which is good because they're also able to give out the most scholarship money. So um, recreating, creating these higher standards kind of helps level the playing field in terms of recruitment. Um, so not all division one colleges are the same. So think about it. When you think of women's college volleyball and you think of D1, like who do you think of? Like Texas, Nebraska, Stanford, like those are the big names you go to, which there's actually been kind of a cool shift that we've been seeing lately, but those are typically like the big names you go to. So there are so many, I mean, I said there's 334 division one um, programs that have a women's volleyball program. And I guarantee you cannot name all of them. So there are so many division one volleyball programs that compete at different levels. So within each, um, within the division one, they all want to compete for the national championship. They all have the opportunity, but they all have their own individual conference and each conference has a different um, level of play. So if you're someone that's like, there is no way that I could play at a Texas or a Nebraska or a Wisconsin, then a smaller division one may be an option for you. So some of the smaller division ones are um, some of the smaller schools that you don't hear a ton of, but they still offer scholarships. They still have great education. They still have a bigger campus size. Um, they have great opportunities. The next group we're going to talk about is division two within the ncaa so division two colleges have a median undergraduate rate 
an undergraduate rate, yeah, of 2,428 students. Again, very precise, looking at my computer. Um, so this creates a one to 10 ratio of student athlete to non-student athlete. So this is really cool to think about. If you have 10 people walking around campus, at least one of them is probably gonna be an athlete. So that's kind of cool, you know, if you wanna be around a lot of athletes. Division two also has more lenient uh, recruiting rules simply because their amount of scholarship is a little bit lower. So their recruiting rules are a little bit more open. And if you miss me talking about timeline on that, make sure you check out this video that I did last time. And it lays out the differences between D1 and D2 recruiting timelines but they have way less strict recruiting rules and they're also a little bit more cost effective for a good education. So D2 schools are a really good option for a ton of athletes. And there are some athletes that opt out of a D1 scholarship offer and choose to go to a D2 just because of the different things that they have to offer, which I'm talking a lot about scholarships offers. And if you're wondering what the different scholarship offers are at each division, don't worry, next time that's exactly what I'm gonna talk about, so hit that bell so that you know when that video comes out. The third division within the NCAA is Division Three. So Division Three has a median undergraduate enrollment of 1,740 students. That's about the size of some high schools, but that's what a D3 is. So this creates a one to six athlete to non-athlete ratio. So if you go to a D3 school that is really sports focused, chances are almost everyone that you have in class with you is gonna be an athlete. So that's kind of cool to think about. Um, so they have little recruiting rules at D3s simply because of their scholarship structure, which is kind of non-existent. But like I said, I'll talk about that next time. Um, so they have very lax recruiting rules, but this is also really cool because the student and the coach can actually kind of create a really good bond before the athlete gets there to play. They can talk all the time almost, and they can create a really cool, really tight bond before they're actually there to play. So those are the three types of NCAA schools. Before I move on to the next type of schools, I wanna talk about the time requirements within each division of the NCAA. It'll kinda of help you get a good picture of um, what is required and just another difference between all of divisions. So within the NCAA, sports-related activities are defined as practice, strength and conditioning, film, competition, and supplement workouts. So this does not include media time, injury prevention, recovery, team fundraising, community engagement, prospective athlete hosting, study hall, or professional development. All of those activities are outside of the structured time. But within the structured time, so within the sports related activities time, division one athletes are expected to spend about 33 hours per week on sports related activities. Division two athletes are expected to spend about 31 hours a week on sports related activities. And division three athletes is 28 hours a week. So there is a big difference within each division, but also think about this. All of these athletes are spending this time on sports related activities, plus all of these things that are not included as sports related activities. Um, and I can guarantee every athlete is in the training room for at least an hour every day. And then they take 16 hours of coursework. So athletes definitely earn their scholarship. It is a lot. But seeing that difference in 33 at D1, 31 at D2, and 28 at D3 kind of gives you a different gist of what's expected at each level. So moving on to the next type of division is the NAIA, so National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics. So this is its own governing system outside of the NCAA. So the NAIA is a very different from the NCAA. They are more lenient. They focus on less cost per sport so that it's an even playing ground playing ground across the nation at all schools. Um, and a lot of times they're really compared to D2s in terms of level of play and time commitment. 
Um, NAIAs also have a different type of scholarship um, formula, I guess you could say, which again is what I'm going to be talking about next time. And um, they also have a different spring season. They actually have like a championship spring season. So there are differences, but in terms of level of play, time commitment, they are comparable to an NCAA Division II. The next group of schools falls in the NJCAA category. So National Junior College Athletic Association. So these are your two year schools. So within the NJCAA, there are three different divisions. There's division one, division two, division three. Each division is um, decided by the governing NJCAA board based on number of students, um, fund availability, region, there's just different things. So there are some JUCO, which is another word for junior college or NJCAA, <laughs> yeah, um, school, that um, the Division One schools are very competitive. So a lot of times athletes that maybe don't have great grades in high school or started the recruiting process way late in the game or, um, had their eye on like a big D1 and they suggested, hey, you know, maybe a year at a JUCO would help you out. Those are the athletes that typically go to a D1 JUCO. So D1 JUCOs are very competitive. They have um, great athletes there that are really using it as a springboard to get to that typically division one level. So um, don't count them out. Don't think they're just, you know, passive small, run-of-the-mill, not great athletes. These typically are where a lot of the athletes get started. And this is typically the best level for international athletes to come into, just because the laws and regulations of the NJCAA are a little bit easier in terms of um, their academic qualifications. So a lot of the international players will come in at this level and it can be really cool to watch these, these teams compete. Another system of two-year schools is the California Community College Athletics Association. So this is a two-year college that is governed by state legislature. I almost did not get that word out. And they have the ability to um, recruit within their community and give scholarships, but only a few of them have the ability to recruit outside of the state. So if you are by one of these colleges, if you are in their recruiting region, this might be an awesome, awesome resource for you to get started or to get seen so that you can springboard to other um schools or if you just want to play college for two years then this may be a really good option for you so that was a lot of information a lot of numbers a lot of words and i bet all of you are still kind of like head spinning so if you want to see all of this information right in front of you you can head to amazon buy my free college resource guide called so you want to play college volleyball or you can follow the link in the description below and put your name and email and get that resource for free, guys. It will send you to a video that talks about my extra VB program, how that extra VB program can help you in your play with biomechanical analysis, plus all of the extra recruiting tips that I give my extra VB athletes. So if you want this written out in front of you so that you can look over it over and over and over, head there, get it for free. And I know there are so many other questions we still have, mostly about scholarships. So mostly what each of these divisions can do for you and how you can get the biggest bang for your buck at each division. So like I said, guys, hang with me, watch next week's video and we will go over that and I will continue to give you every resource I have. See you next time.